Heroes created by people's imagination live and commit their acts of bravery in our program, The Legend of Kazakhs. Legends are an invaluable cultural heritage passed down from generation to generation. Since ancient times, music has played a significant role in traditional Kazakh culture. There are more than 50 types of instruments which are used by folk musicians, such as the dumbra, kobus, sibizge, daulpaz, shertir, jitigen, and many others. Singers and kuishi dombrists have always been beloved and revered. And if they come to visit a house, then it was considered a great holiday. In distant past, the strings of the dumbra were made from the guts of animals, which made a gentle, soft, and melodious velvet sound of the dumbra. All folk performers such as akuns, jirshiz, and dumbra players possessed a delicate perception of the world and a unique memory, thanks to which many works survived in the musical history. Music was inextricably linked with the life of a person, which is his way of life and traditions. After all, music from immemorial time was for the Kazakh people a direct source of knowledge, which brought people understanding of the beauty of the world and the sublimity of feelings. Folk melodies are distinguished by their ability to penetrate and their sincerity. Kazakhs have a lot of national musical instruments. However, the most beloved was and remains the beautiful Dombra. A lot of legends have been written about the origin of the Dumbra, and we will tell you about one of them now. The Han emerged from his tent peering at the setting crimson sun, heavy thoughts prevailed over him. Once again, the blood of his batirs will be shed. Wives and children will cry again. The ferocious hordes of nomads were coming to his land. The great Khan prepared his army for the campaign. The Han called his faithful servant, the brave Qasim, in the battle, Qasim, you are always courageous, clever, and you are always faithful to me, the Khan began. Now I am asking you to serve my one and only son faithfully. He is still small to take him to war, and if I do not come back... The Khan then fell silent, but then he continued, If I don't come back, there will be nobody to nurture him. You must accompany my son to my brother. He will raise him, and you will teach him military art. The warrior bowed before the Han. You will always be with him. You will protect him. Take everything you need and get ready to go. Just do not go through the gorge. There is the possession of Du Kara. No one comes out alive from this place. Go along the bypass road. Not a fast way, but a safe way. My brother is waiting for you. He will be generous with you, Qasim. I will do everything you have ordered, my Khan. My sharp sword and my life will now belong to the young Khan, Sirkye. Early in the morning, the warriors galloped to the white yurt. 
It took a long time for the Khan to say goodbye to his son. He hugged his son and kissed him on the forehead. For many days, Qasim was traveling with the young Hans through the steppe until he reached the big rocky mountains. There was a broad road straight to the summit along the mountain, breaching to the sides. Qasim looked around the mountain with a thoughtful look and then turned the horse. Uncle Qasim, why are we turning away instead of rising on this mountain? Our horse can climb it. Sirke Khan, the Jigit answered, you are right, but we can cut our way for a dozen days and the horses will be able to have passed along it. But this road leads to the gorge where the cruel great Deo Kara lives with his huge dragon, Aidahar. The strongest and the most courageous of Batirs have gone to the giant, summoned him to battle but not a single one of them have returned. The boy listened to the stories of his servant with an open mouth. You know, Qasim, the boy exclaimed suddenly, when I grow up, I will fight with Deokara. Qasim smiled and affectionately said, of course, my boy, I'll help you do this. They laughed and moved along the road, skirting the rocky mountains. To the richly decorated yurt, the Jigit flew on his horse and collapsed from fatigue. A joyful message spread all over the Aul. The message from the great Khan had arrived. After ten years, he has returned at last home to his village, and he is waiting for his son, Sirkye. Tears sprinkled down from Qasim's eyes. He embraced his Sirkye, now a tall and strong Batir. Sirke immediately met him on the road. He embraced his uncle and bowed low to him, because he replaced his father to him. His uncle gave to his nephew two of the fastest stallions, which easily can overtake a flying bird. Have a safe trip, his uncle said, hugging Sirke tightly. Sirke and his faithful servant Qasim saddled their horses and set out on their journey. Without touching the ground, the stallions rushed through the steppe, but Sirke's heart beat faster than ever. This is because he wanted to see his father. They overcame half of the way when they were blocked by the high mountains. Only Qasim turned his horse, bypassing the mountains. As Sirke's imperilous voice stopped him, Why is this? You've turned your horse? Have you forgotten our conversation, huh? Do you remember that I told you when I was a child that when I grow up, I will not turn off the road and go around? I remember, Qasim answered. I do not want to lose so many days touring this mountain. I haven't seen my father for seven years. Qasim nodded his head. Remember I said it, continued the Batir that I will fight the terrible Deu Kara. I remember, I remember. I even remember that I told you I would help you with this. I will go with you wherever you go. Only know that the giant has a dragon. He gets his master food when he sleeps. We need to overcome not only Deu Kara, but also his Aidahar. And know also that Aidahar always flies high. Arrows do not reach him. He kills all of them with fire that erupts from his mouth. Go ahead, exclaimed Serke, as he galloped along the mountain road, meandering like a big snake. Serke, yes, you are stubborn like your father, Qasim shouted after him. They climbed to the top of the ridge and saw below a lifeless valley. Even the trees there were dry and twisted. They descended from the mountain to the ravine, and there was not a singing bird, nor the usual noise of wildlife. The further they advanced along the gorge, the more often they began to come across them. The sun burned bones and skulls of animals and people. The horses rode in fear through the valley, faster and faster.
suddenly a huge shadow fell over them. The Batirs raised their head and saw the big, awful dragon. He circled above them and descended below. He opened his mouth. A big, red-hot flame burst from him. But the horsemen and the horses were incredibly fast. No matter how hard the dragon tried, he could not touch them with his fire. Tired Idahar could not keep up with the quick horses. Sirke came up with an idea of how to overcome the dragon. They galloped to the high hill and waited. When Idahar flew over the hill, he went very low looking for the people. Suddenly the brave Sirke jumped out from behind the large stone and he waved his sword. Idahar's head flew off, and the dead dragon crashed to the ground, surrounded with clouds of smoke and fire. They galloped on, but suddenly the earth shook. They turned around, and the Batirs saw the giant running after them. The horses stumbled in fear. The giant pulled out huge trees like blades of grass and ran straight to them. Kasim stumbled and fell to the ground. The giant stopped before Kasim and raised his foot to crush him. Sirke saw it and rushed to the giant, defending his faithful friend and servant from the obvious death. With all of his might, the Batir struck his sharp sword and pierced Deokara's leg. The giant turned from pain and rushed after Sirke, throwing trees and huge stone boulders at him. There was a Batir on the edge of the ledge of the cliff. There was no further road, only the road ahead. Sirke boldly turned his horse and bravely rushed to the giant, tightly clutching the hilt of the sword. But as soon as Deokara ran to the Batir, under his feet the stone crashed. Before that, as the giant was very heavy, under the weight of his body the ledge of the rocks collapsed, taking to the abyss the brave Batir and the bloodthirsty Deokara. For three days and three nights, Kasim shed tears. He could not forgive himself for the death of the young Khan, because Sirke was like a son to him. He sat over the abyss and mourned the brave Batir. He felt his heart breaking in his chest. The great Khan was waiting for them, and it was necessary for Qasim to bring his son back to the old warrior, and he did not know how to tell him about Sirke's death, how to describe the pain that pierces him how his soul is torn to pieces. Qasim did not fear death. It would have been terrible, but if the great Khan who was distraught by the grief would kill him, on the contrary, it would save him from this suffering and grief. It was a dark night, and Qasim heard the shrill cry in the wind, the crackling and rumbling of the falling stones, the crunch of the broken dry branches. Qasim listened and understood. Only those mournful sounds would tell about his feelings. He fell asleep and saw something made of wood in the dream with long strings. As soon as the sun rose, he approached the tree torn out by the giant, and he began to hollow out of the trunk what he had seen in his dream. Cutting off a bundle of horsehair and weaving two bundles of it together, he attached the strings to the wooden case and then ran his fingers over them. The strings trembled, and from a distance the piercing sound from which the heart grew cold. Yes, that's how his soul wept bitterly. Qasim came to the great Khan and sat down, in silence next to him. The Khan squeezed his fists hard. He realized that sad news had come to his house. The Khan stared at his old warrior and waited for words from him. But Qasim said nothing and sat down silently, holding the Dumbra in his hands. Speak, 
the Han shouted. Hasim touched the strings with his fingers, and the Han heard the woeful sounds, as if thousands of women were moaning, mourning their child. The sounds pierced his heart, and big tears rolled down the Han's eyes. He realized that death had overtaken his only son. A great grief lay over the Aul, but the Han did not punish the faithful Qasim. In fact, sometimes he would ask him to play on the Dumbra, which told about Sirke's heroic death. Any musical creation of a person can reflect his own reality, what a person sees and how he feels, as well as what he hears. But musical thoughts are created in the mind of a man. That's how melodies and songs are born. Every significant Kazakh family event is celebrated solemnly, furnished with appropriate rituals, which were the reason for creating tunes and songs and kuis. As a rule, they served as an explanation of the ritual. The most common national musical instrument is the dumbra. The technique of playing the dumbra is similar to the methods of playing any plucked instrument. The left hand of the musician slides freely over the neck. With the help of the fingers on the right hand, striking both strings, the sound is extracted. The singing is velvety, with rhythmic sounds of the dumbra talking about the boundless steppes, the quiet Jai Laos with their peaceful grazing herds. necessary to strengthen the sound of the dumbra, and the melody rushes after the herd of stallions galloping in the pasture. In the step tunes of the dumbra, one can catch the rustling of the grass, as well as the babbling of the brooks and streams, the exultation of choirs of birds, and the neighing of horses and the clatter of their hoofs. The dumbra has a pear-shaped body, with two strings and a long neck, it is on the neck where the frets are fastened. Clamping the strings between the frets, you can get a more melodic sound. It is interesting that the Kazakh name Dombra is formed from a combination of two words. The word Dom means sound, and Bra means the tuning of strings. The birth of the Kazakh folk instrument begins with the choice of wood. Traditionally, the master cuts out a body of hard wood maple, oak, or pine. The production of each detail of the dumbra, and in particular the deck, with a spring that serves as a sound amplifier, requires precision and endurance. The accuracy of even one millimeter leads to wheezing and rattling during the game. The Kazakh people were and remain the creators of wonderful music, colorful, original, and rich. Dreams of eternal life forced people at different times to invent the elixir of immortality, because always a man wanted to live long, like the gods. True, it was never possible to create an elixir of youth. However, kumus can be attributed to drinks that give you health and youth. In the next program, we will tell you one of the legends about the origin of kumus.